So over the next few weeks, you're going to start hearing stories about how the Chinese space station Tiangong-1 is about to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. Disregard any headline you hear saying that your town or your country is in the danger zone. Anyone who professes to know the precise impact point of Tiangong-1 at this point is... Well, lying. Now to get this out of the way, there are no Tycho knots on board Tiangong-1, and the spacecraft is expected to burn up before it reaches the surface, so there's really no danger to anyone. Still, you may have heard that the projected entry point is anywhere between 43 degrees north latitude and 43 degrees south latitude, and that is true. But that's only because that's the entire span of the Earth's surface that Tiangong could ever fly over. But still, somewhere between 43 north and 43 south is more than two-thirds of the surface of the Earth, and aren't we used to hearing about space travel spoken of in a bit more precise terms than that? If we know where Tiangong is right now, and we do, and if orbits can be projected so accurately, and they can, why isn't it possible to better nail down where Tiangong-1 is going to come in? Well, with Tiangong-1, it really comes down to two factors. The atmosphere and the flight path angle, and I want to illustrate the problem like this. Imagine you're standing on top of a tall building with a bunch of pine cones. It doesn't have to be pine cones, any dense object will do, but I had to make this video quickly, and pine cones are what I had because I work at an environmental superfund site that causes the pine trees to grow really big and drop a bunch of pine cones. Anyway. The top of this building represents space, and the ground represents... the ground. Now one by one, you drop the pine cones. They're going to hit the ground in different places and get spread out over a wide region. Now, using statistical analysis, we can quantify this region with what we call an error ellipse. The error ellipse has a downrange dimension and a crossrange dimension. And what the error ellipse means is that the object has a certain probability, say 68% or 95% or 99%, of landing within the ellipse. Now, imagine repeating this experiment with paper airplanes, and instead of dropping them from the building, you throw them out horizontally. If we compare the two error ellipses of the pine cones to the paper airplanes, you'll see that the pine cones are much more tightly clustered than the paper planes. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons. One, the pine cones were dropped, not thrown. So they're coming down almost vertically. And because they're moving almost vertically, small uncertainties in their initial velocities don't translate to large errors in their impact point. The paper planes, on the other hand, are coming down almost horizontally. So small errors in their initial velocity are going to lead to large errors in their impact point. The angle that these objects make with respect to the horizon is called the flight path angle, and it's one of the biggest sources of uncertainty when trying to predict the landing ellipse of a re-entering object. Now to relate this to Tiangong-1, here is a plot of Tiangong's orbit around the Earth. To make things easier, I'm going to take this 3D representation and unwrap it into a 2D planner representation. Flat Earthers, stay out of the comments section. I have a spray bottle and I swear to God I will use it. Now on this scale, here is the height of Mount Everest, here is where the ISS orbits, and here is where Tiangong currently is. So where is the edge of the atmosphere in this diagram? Well, it's somewhere around here. Remember, the atmosphere doesn't actually stop at some altitude, it just tapers away, getting thinner and thinner. So instead of talking about the edge of the atmosphere, we usually talk about the edge of the sensible atmosphere. The sensible atmosphere is the point where the spacecraft could no longer detect the deceleration due to the atmosphere. A spacecraft on a controlled re-entry usually comes down the steepest flight path angle it can get away with without burning up, and it's typically between 2 and 5 degrees. This means it only spends a few minutes in the atmosphere before reaching the surface. In such a short time, there's really not much time for atmospheric perturbations to stack up, and the error ellipse of such an object can be really small. But what is the flight path angle of Tiangong? Well, Tiangong is still in orbit. It is descending at a few centimeters a second, but it's also moving horizontally at over 7 million centimeters per second. Orbital velocity. That translates to a flight path angle of only a few millionths of a degree. So instead of spending just a few minutes in the atmosphere, Tiangong has spent the last several months in the sensible atmosphere. That means we can only predict its re-entry to within a week or so. And since a week is a long enough time for the spacecraft to orbit the Earth a hundred times, and since the Earth rotates under the orbital track once every day, that really means it's impossible to say with confidence where the spacecraft is going to come down at this point. Adding to the difficulty is the fact that the location of the sensible atmosphere isn't at a fixed altitude. You know how weather maps sometimes show high pressure regions and low pressure regions here on the surface? Well, that exact same thing happens in the upper atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere shrinks and expands throughout the day as it's heated by the sun. 
so the amount of air at a given altitude can change a lot in unpredictable ways. And after spending so many months in an uncertain environment, the error ellipse for Tiangong is really quite big, big enough to encompass almost the entire surface of the Earth. One more confounding factor, going back out to our pine cones and paper airplane analogy, you may have noticed that the paper airplanes are blown around by the atmosphere a lot more on their way down. This is a problem with predicting Tiangong's re-entry as well. That and Tiangong doesn't have a nice, simple aerodynamic shape like an entry capsule does, so the effects of the atmospheric perturbations are even less certain. If this sounds complicated, well, yes, this is literally rocket science, or rocket engineering. There's a reason why this kind of thing is difficult. But I do have good news. It's not going to stay difficult for long. Once Tiangong reaches around 150 kilometers in altitude, the flight path angle is going to start getting a lot steeper a lot quicker, and the error ellipse is going to start shrinking very quick. And wherever it happens to be, if there happens to be people around, and those people have access to the internet, and they're checking their news feed at the time, those people are going to get about an hour's notice before the spacecraft re-enters, and will get to go outside and enjoy the light show. Again, Tiangong is a space station. It's not designed to survive re-entry intact, so we aren't sure yet if any of the pieces are going to make it to the surface that are big enough to worry about. But even if they don't, a re-entering spacecraft usually produces a long and enduring streak across the sky. So rather than panicking about the nearly non-existent threat of orbital debris, I really hope people will take this opportunity to appreciate the fact that we have a chance of people observing something that usually takes place in the middle of the Pacific, where there's no one around to watch it. So in summary, it's really hard to predict where Tiangong-1 is going to come down right now because its flight path angle is so shallow, and the atmospheric behavior at this altitude is very hard to predict. Right now, all we can say is that it'll come down somewhere between 43 degrees north and 43 degrees south, somewhere within a few days of April 1st of 2018. But those windows are going to get much, much smaller as the re-entry gets closer. Tiangong is probably going to come down over an ocean, but if it does come down over land, it's probably not going to do so near people. But if it does re-enter near people, it's probably not going to do any damage. Finally, disregard any news stories you hear claiming that Tiangong is going to come down on your hometown or your country unless those stories are published within a few hours of re-entry. And if you are in one of the people who has one of those stories published about your area within a few hours of re-entry, lucky you! Get outside and enjoy the light show. Bus break up. Nice flashes. Oh wow. Is that lower right? Lower right. Keep cheating. Reentry vehicle looks like lower right. Peak deceleration. Can we get an altitude call? Uh, if you have a chance to look out of the window, look out of the window because the view is spectacular. 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 Wow. Peter, tell me if we need to keep turning. Uh, uh, the object is gradually moving by us. It is uh, almost paused. Okay. End screen. End screen. End screen. So I've been on YouTube for uh, almost 12 years now, um, and I've never really gotten into regular content creation, mostly because I have a full-time job that I love very much, and uh, there was just never any time for it. That said, over the last five years, I've been very happy to witness YouTube's successful transition from a mere entertainment platform to a platform for actual education and outreach. I still am interested in seeing what the medium of the short form video essay can accomplish. I don't know if the market has been saturated of uh, people sitting in a bedroom talking to their camera using jump cuts to cover up the fact that they're talking from a prompter. I don't know if YouTube really needs another one of those. So I guess what I'm saying is consider this video my very temporary uh, foray into the already crowded waters of the YouTube education space. If you're interested, uh, here is a list of some already well-established uh, education channels that, with much higher production values and uh, much better hosts who, uh, who have kind of inspired me to take this step. If you don't already subscribe to these channels, uh, please do so. They make great, great material. 
And if you liked this, uh, well, comment, share, like, subscribe, and if you happen to know any other space topics that are not getting enough coverage, uh, if it's something I'm interested in and feel qualified to talk about, uh, let me know and I'll try to make a video essay about it. Thanks for watching, and until I come up with a better name and catchphrase for this channel, thanks for watching.